Well, if you've been following the Karen Reed case, then you know exactly where we stand right now. Where we stand right now is that Karen Reed has a decision to make whether she's going to appeal Judge Canoni's decision denying her motion to dismiss. And we're going to be jumping into whether I feel an appeal is a good idea for her at this point. But first, in case you're just joining us now, or if you just want to quickly get a recap of where we stand right now, that's where we're just going to spend a few minutes on recapping where we are right now and just understanding the law a little bit, and then we'll jump into whether this is a good idea to appeal or not. Well, what happened in this case was the uh, jury got the case. They deliberated for a number of days. They sent out a few notes saying that they're hung, and Judge Canoni eventually read for them the Tui Rodriguez charge. The Tui Rodriguez charge basically just says, keep an open mind, try to see if you can reach a consensus or not, go back and continue the deliberations. Now, the law in Massachusetts is that once she reads them, the Tui Rodriguez charge, and sends them back for further deliberations, then she is not allowed to send them back again if they send out a note saying that they're still hung. So if after the Tui Rodriguez charge is read, they send out a note saying we're still hung, she is not allowed under the law to send them back for further deliberations. So when she got that last note, after she read the Tui Rodriguez charge, instead of talking to the lawyers about what the note says, seeing if there's any suggestions that they have, she just called the jury back, read the note, and declared a mistrial and excused the jury. The jury went home. A few days later, some of the jurors reached out to the defense, defense attorneys and said that really we were not hung on charges one and charge three. We were only hung on charge two. And therefore, really, we, want, we were ready to acquit Karen Reed on charge one and charge three. And therefore, if she's acquitted, then obviously double jeopardy should attach. So that is the first argument that the defense made in their motions, that since really the jury acquitted Karen Reed unanimously on count one and count three, we cannot charge and have another trial about count one and count three. That is the very basics of double jeopardy, that if a defendant is acquitted of any sort of charge, they can the government cannot bring that charge again. So that was the first basis of their motion. And some of the confusion arises from the note, the language in the note, which said that they are hung on the charges. Can the charges mean only the charges found in count two, or does the charges mean all the charges? We've explained this all in previous videos. The simple meaning definitely would mean that it's, they're hung on all the charges, but nevertheless, the defense makes an argument that that note itself is ambiguous, and really the judge should have clarified exactly what they were hung on. So, and that was one argument that they made. The other argument that they made was the fact that Judge Canoni did not consult with the attorneys before declaring a mistrial. The general practice is that when you get a note as the judge, the first thing that you do is call the attorneys back, tell them that you have a note, read the note to them, ask them what you want, that what you think, uh, what the attorneys think the judge should do in this, in the because of this note, what answer the, the judge should give, and then make a record, and then call the jury back and read the note, and the judge will decide what to do at that point. And then after that, maybe ask the attorneys, do you have any objections to what I did? Do you want to make a record, et cetera? So that was the normal practice. And certainly that was not followed with the third note. The first two notes that practice was followed, which is right. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. But with the third note, Judge Canoni did not really engage in what's normal for the judge to do in that situation. Now, is that going to be a big problem? Is that is that alone a basis to dismiss this case based on double jeopardy? Not so simple at all. But there's an argument that in order for a judge to declare a mistrial and for double jeopardy to not attach, the declaration of a mistrial has to have been appropriate. If it's inappropriate for the judge to declare the mistrial in the way that she did, then double jeopardy could certainly attach. And we've explained this all in previous videos. We did a deep dive in all of the case law that's uh, associated with this issue of double jeopardy, specifically when it's when it has to do with a mistrial being declared inappropriately. We did a deep dive on all of that, so go check out my other videos if you haven't yet to really get a good understanding of the law. Now, of course, if you just want to act on your emotions and based on what you feel, then you don't need to watch those motions. But if you really want to understand what the law has to say about this and what the law's opinion is, which is ultimately going to carry the day, then you can definitely go check out the other videos that we did on this, which really explains all of the law that's associated with these two issues. Now, the law is pretty clear that the only time in, under Massachusetts law that you're able to bring back the jury and ask them really what their vote was is if there was racial bias that was injected into the jury deliberations. That's the only law that we found in Massachusetts 
and that was cited in the briefs, which allow you to call the jury, the jurors back and again, ask them whether there was any sort of racial bias injected into their decisions and then either uh, find that there is uh, there was the mistrial was was inappropriate or maybe double jeopardy should attach. Okay, but that's the only time that we bring back the jurors. So that argument, like we explained from the outset when this motion was filed, we explained this in a number of different videos, that argument is not a good argument. It's not going to win. The only argument that you can make in with that respect is that you want to argue for new law in Massachusetts, which you have the right to do. If you have a good faith belief that the law should change in Massachusetts or should be expanded in any way, you can certainly argue that and make your case to the Supreme Court that they should change the law as it as it stands right now with respect to when you're allowed to call the jury back. But I will tell you that specifically with under these circumstances and these facts, it's going to be very difficult for the Supreme Court to do that. Because if it's racial bias, then that's pretty much, that, that's so unfair. It's such a lack of due process that, of course, the, the Supreme Court is going to say you got to call the jury back. But in this situation where you can argue that the jurors were confused by some of the some of the instructions or they're confused by the, the verdict slip or the verdict form or confused by some of the instructions by the judge, that's not going to be a great basis for the Supreme Court to now make a new law and establish new guidelines when you're allowed to bring the jury back. Because where do you draw the line? At what point, at what point of confusion do we allow the jurors to come back? And in probably a lot of cases, you're going to have jurors that were confused by some of the instructions. So that's just the nature of, of trials. Sometimes the jurors are just not going to completely understand the instructions. And if they don't understand the instructions, then they should send out a note saying, we don't understand some of the instructions. Can you please explain it? But to make a new law that we're allowed, we're now going to allow the jurors to be called back because of some sort of confusion. Well, at what point? Where do you draw the line? What guidelines can you possibly give for what point, what part of how confused do the jurors have to be in order to bring the juries back? So it's going to be a very difficult task if you're going to be asking the Supreme Court to make a new rule, a new law in Massachusetts when you're allowed to bring the jury back, absent something significant like racial or ethnic bias. So that argument, again, is not going to be a winner type of argument. When you have something so significant, when you have something that's so terrible and just just smacks of a lack of due process, then you, well, then you have a better chance of getting the Supreme Court to make a new rule or new law in Massachusetts. But in this case, when there's confusion, things like that, you're not going to get the Supreme Court to make a new law in the state of Massachusetts. So again, that whole argument is not a great argument. The better argument, which we've always maintained on this channel, the better argument is the fact that the mistrial was inappropriate, or at least the argument that it's possible that the mistrial was inappropriate. And that comes under the a few other prongs. Let's talk about the manifest necessity. Manifest necessity means that the, the judge can declare a mistrial if there is manifest necessity. And under the case law, it's clear that in order for the judge to rule that there's going to be a mistrial, to, to declare a mistrial in this case, they have to do two things. Number one, they have to give counsel full opportunity to be heard, and they also have to carefully consider the alternatives to declaring a mistrial. Now, that was not done in this case. Absolutely, it was not done in this case. Now, there is one case, as we've spoken about in this channel previously, there is one case that seems to suggest wrongly so, that the judge does not need to uh, does not need to go through that process, does not need to ask the uh, give the attorneys full opportunity to be heard and to carefully consider the alternatives. There is one case, Commonwealth versus Fuentes, but in my opinion, there's so there's a number of other Supreme Court cases which completely contradict that that the only the only conclusion you can come to is that Fuentes was wrongly decided. So, Let's just work with that. Manifest necessity. So under the manifest necessity prong, since Judge Canoni definitely did not do that, well, maybe they have an argument that the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court of Massachusetts should reverse Judge Canoni because this, the, the, this was not, this procedure was not followed to in order to declare a mistrial based on manifest necessity. Now, that alone seems to be a decent argument to be made because Judge Canoni certainly did not follow what you're supposed to do under the law. And we've also pointed out some of the other flaws 
in Judge Canoni's decision. We did a, an entire video about that as well. You can go check out what I have to say about Judge Canoni's actual opinion. And there's a number of flaws in her analysis. So, so for example, the fact that she found that the fact that David Yannetti asked for a Tui Rodriguez charge twice means that he consented to a mistrial. That is wrong. That's just not, it's inaccurate. It's not a good analysis. It's a faulty analysis. And that's also something that the, that the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court can right away say that she made a mistake. So here's the problem, though. The problem that I've always maintained for the past few videos is the fact that the defense really did consent to a mistrial. The way that they consented was not by the way that they asked for a Tui Rodriguez charge. That has nothing to do with the consent. The reason that they consented is because the case law is clear. It's abundantly clear that the defense counsel has to object. If you don't object, then that equals consent. And that's just what the case law says. There's only one case, which I've always talked about. There's one case that says that if the defense did not object, then it will not equal consent. And that is a situation where you had no idea you had no clue that the judge was just going to walk into the room and declare a mistrial. In that case, it was in the middle of a trial. No one knew what was going on. The judge walked in and said, we're declaring a mistrial. Have a nice day. And everyone's just sitting there with their mouths open. So there, okay, the fact that the defense did not object because they're still trying to get their bearings of what exactly just happened. But when, a, when an attorney has a reasonable anticipation that the a judge is going to declare a mistrial, and these are both seasoned attorneys, Yanetti and Jackson, they know, and they should know, that if the judge read a Tui Rodriguez charge, and there's been a number of notes saying that the jury is hung, that very likely the judge is going to declare a mistrial at some point. So if you have any sort of objection to that, you better get ready, because it's going to happen. So you can reasonably anticipate that there's going to be a mistrial, and therefore you have business objecting. And if you don't object, the case law is clear, it's crystal clear, that if you don't object, then that equals consent, okay? So you're right. Under the manifest necessity prong, under that rule, the judge failed. And if it was just because of manifest necessity, you'd have a chance at appeal. But the fact that they did not object, and you can't argue really in this case that they didn't have an opportunity to object, they could have objected at some point, either after and Judge Canoni declared the mistrial before she excused the jury, or even after she excused the jury, she, they could have lodged their objections. And while they're talking about the scheduling, they could have lodged their objections. So there definitely was opportunity for them to object. And the case law is clear that if they don't object in Massachusetts, if you don't object to that declaration of a mistrial, so then you have then consented to the mistrial. If you consent to a mistrial, then double jeopardy does not attach. You don't even move on to the idea, the whole issue of manifest necessity. So what's going to happen if they appeal? And according to Mar Marty Weinberg, he, they are going to vigorously appeal, which means that they're going to not only appeal to the Court of Appeals, but if the Court of Appeals uh, does not reverse Judge Canoni, then they're going to appeal to the Court of, then the Supreme Court of Massachusetts to ask them to reverse Judge Canoni's decision. So that's what I take that as being. Now, the appeal is going to fail. The appeal is absolutely going to fail. And if you have someone who's already convicted of a crime and they're sitting in jail, so then, of course, you have to explore all possible avenues of appeal because the person has nothing to lose. Otherwise, they're just going to be sitting in jail for the rest of their lives. In this case, it's very different because you have, a, you have another trial which is slated to begin in January. And for a number of reasons, Karen Reed is much better off if the trial is retried sooner rather than later. So. The appeal is going to fail because, very clearly, because they consented to the mistrial. Whether, doesn't matter what you argue. The point is, is that they did not they did not lodge their objection and the case law is clear. And I've explained all of this case law in the previous videos, how the case law is clear that if they don't object, that equals consent. That means that they consented to the mistrial. If you consent to a mistrial, then there is no double jeopardy. So what would happen if they do appeal? I'm going to tell you. If they appeal and and I'm sitting on the Court of Appeals, this is what I would do. I would point out the faulty analysis of Judge Canoni, a number of different problems that I have with her analysis, but ultimately I would say that we're not going to reverse her because at the end of the day, they did not object. And because they didn't object, that part of the analysis that Judge Canoni ran through, that part of the analysis is correct. And under Massachusetts law, failing to object is consent. Now you're going to argue, well, we should make new law well, let's argue for new law that just because you don't object, then there that does not mean that you're going to that does not mean that you're consenting. 
Well, that's not going to happen either because the case law is pretty clear. It's pretty solid. And in in uh, courts, you have to object. That's how it works with a whole bunch of appealable issues. If you don't object to a specific issue, then it's not preserved for appeal. That's just the way it works. That's just, they're not going to change the entire way that the that the system works. This is how the jurisdictions in every jurisdiction works. So you have to object if you want that issue rate if you want that issue preserved for appeal. Now there are some very very limited instances where something could be so egregious or something could be so unfair that you can argue that we don't even need to object. But the case law again is clear in Massachusetts that you do have to object, and I don't see any way that the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court is going to change the law. So if you want to advocate for changing the law, either because we should allow the jurors to come back and uh, tell us what the, really what their verdict was in a case of confusion, I explained that's not going to happen. To argue that there should be a new law about failing to object does not equal consent, that's not going to happen. And therefore, as a legal scholar, you probably would want this taken up because I think personally that Fuentes is wrong. And I want the Supreme Court in Massachusetts to correct that and say, we've We've, we've looked through all of the law in this case, and we can clearly tell you that Fuentes is wrong. The other Supreme Court decisions, which all say clearly that you do have to, as a judge, go through, give opportunity for counsel to be heard, and also explore alternatives on the record. That is the law in Massachusetts, so I'd like to see Fuentes be overruled because I feel that it was wrongly decided. And also, if you want, just for kicks, for an opinion to say how Judge Canoni uh, made some mistakes, then okay, then you know we would we would see that opinion. But ultimately, it's not you're not going to get a you're not going to get a reversal of Judge Canoni's ruling on this matter. And therefore, this is what I would say: if you're Karen Reed, or if you have any sort of sway with Karen Reed's defense team, or if you have any sort of connections with Karen Reed's defense team, the very clear advice is: do not appeal, because if you appeal, you're absolutely going to lose. And Here's the other reason why you don't. Have, so why not appeal anyway? Well, number one is that it's very costly. It's very costly to appeal. And we know that if you want Karen Reed to have the best possible defense in her trial, then it's going to cost a lot of money. Alan Jackson's not cheap. So if you want to, for her to have the greatest defense and you want to preserve her resources, you don't want her to waste 50 grand now on, or 100 grand or 150 grand or whatever it is on these attorneys getting the getting the transcripts and then writing a whole appeal which can take hours and hours and hours appeal is very very costly work i know i've done appeals it's very costly it's extremely time consuming and i'm not saying the attorneys are wrong for charging that 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 amount of money because it is very costly it takes a lot of time and you got to read through transcripts and you got to do a lot of research and you got to put together the right brief and you got to do all of the requirements that the court of appeals requires. And then maybe the Supreme court is going to require if the court of appeals does, does re rejects the appeal, uh, the appeal for whatever reason. So it's very, very costly. So number one, if you care about Karen Reed's bottom line, you care about all the people that are raising money for her, for her defense, then it's just a waste of money. That's number one. Now, of course, if I'm the lawyer and Karen Reed comes and meets with me and says, can you handle this appeal? I'll pay you 150 grand. Well, of course, why, why would I take, you know, why would I say that uh, I'm not interested in your business? Of course, if I'm the attorney, I mean, again, I, I would hope that I'd be honest enough to tell her that, you know, I don't think this is an appeal that's going to win. I'd be very honest. And what I try to be very honest with all my clients and tell them whether I think this is a good shot or not, instead of them wasting all their money. But I can see attorneys saying, okay, you want to appeal? Sure. Just, just sign me the check and I'll, I'll do whatever you want. So it's a very costly appeal. Number two, the reason why you don't want to appeal in this case is that the time, and the time is very important in this case, because right now the state is under the gun. The government, Adam Lally, the prosecution, the, the Commonwealth, they're under the gun right now. They only have a couple of months and they realize that they made a terrible mistake in bringing this case and they need to bring it differently the second time. If you give them now two, three years to prepare again and find more experts and perhaps experts that can contradict the experts that the defense brought the biomechanical engineers who reconstructed this accident and they won't, they can't, the government now cannot rely on Trooper Paul, then that's something that you don't want. You don't want to give Lally the more time. When you have the facts on your side, when you have the evidence on your side, when you're in a stronger position, you want trial to, to happen immediately. You want trial to happen sooner rather than later. You don't want to give the other side the opportunity to develop a defense, which is why generally speaking, if you're on the defense, 
of a criminal defendant, you want there to be continuances. You want there to be more time because the more time for you, you can try to develop more ways to win your case. But in this case, when you have the evidence on your side, which she does at this point, at this point, if they try it again today without the same exact case, there's just no way that they're going to win again. Again, we don't know what the jury's going to do. Any jury can do anything that they want. But objectively, looking at the evidence in this case, when she has these two experts who are saying that it's just inconsistent that the theory of the state happened in this case, it's against science and physics, well then, that's the case that you want to immediately try again as soon as you can. If the more time that you give the prosecution, the more time you give government, the more time you give Adam Lally, the more time that he can research and figure out other ways to bring this case, that's not what you want if you're Karen Reed. Even though it's going to buy you some, maybe a year or two of, of not sitting in jail, you want the case to try be tried again as soon as possible. And especially now also, let's remember that a lot of these troopers now have been, uh, are being either investigated or, or in Proctor's case has been dismissed. So that's exactly what you want. You want to go on the heel of these troopers getting reprimanded, getting without, getting investigated and sent away without pay. This is what you want. So you got you got Tully, you got Proctor, you got Bukinek, all these people that are the central players in your in this case. They're either being investigated or they were they were already dismissed. So you want to go right on the heels of that. It's going to be put much more pressure on the prosecution in this case to retry this case when you know Proctor just literally a, a month or two ago, got dismissed without pay, put on leave, and now you have these other troopers that are investigated. The, this, the government can just feel like, oh, the, the, the time is just coming up so fast, and we don't know what we're going to do about this. They're not going to be able to try the case as efficiently as they'd like to. But if you give them more time, then that's exactly what they want. So the prosecution, I'm, I guarantee you, the government, Adam Lally, he is hoping, hoping beyond hope, that Karen Reed's defense team is going to appeal this decision because it's going to lose and it's just going to buy him more time to figure out how to bring this case stronger the next time. So if you care about Karen Reed, if you care about her bottom line, if you care about her actually being found not guilty again, then my advice to you would be do not appeal. Go straight for the trial in January. Get this done as soon as possible. Right now, you've got the evidence. You've got the facts on your side, and you're going to win again if everything stays the same, and it just puts a lot more pressure on the government. So that is my take on the appeal, and that's why you know I don't have any sort of influence or sway with the Karen Reed team, but if they'd be calling me for my opinion, this is exactly what I tell them. Do not appeal. You're going to lose. Just try the case again as soon as possible, and that will put a lot more pressure on the government. Well, that is it for now. That's my take on the appeal. If you haven't yet, please subscribe, like, and we will see you next time.